Thank you very, very much. What an honor to be here today. Let's open with uh, a little anecdote or two about my wonderful grandfather, R.J. Reynolds. Founded the tobacco company in 1875, didn't know how dangerous tobacco was going to be or that it would go on to kill hundreds of millions of people. He put out a press release uh, before camels were introduced in 1913. Uh, I guess it was a news release because and wondering, uh, he said he called his brothers and said, hey, hold up the introduction to camels because I think the paper might be dangerous, not the tobacco. <laughs> and uh, whether that was a made up uh, story or not, who knows. But camels were rolled out in 1913 and made marketing history. Reynolds uh, basically mounted the first national ad campaign with full page ads in all these newspapers that said camels are coming. And that had never been done. The next day, tomorrow in your city, there'll be more camels than in all of Arabia. People said, what are camels? And the next day, all the full page ads across the country on the same day said, today you can buy camel cigarettes at your local pharmacy or tobacconist. Well, we'll move on. Uh, two kinds of wealthy people in this country, the rising business class and the declining old rich. And my family's in the declining old rich because the fathers weren't there to show the children business and to teach them and be there and restrain them. And the declining old rich, like my family, you basically have fathers who are absent. Um, and there's my dad in his heyday of the 1940s as a naval officer in World War II. He was a navigator on a fleet of ships. And the, the declining old rich, the family, the fathers aren't there. They have a lot of inherited money at a young age, and that's what happened. If you want to know more about my amazing family, I wrote a book just to sort of process everything that happened. And it's called The Gilded Leaf. And with luck, it'll wind up as a TV a series on HBO. <laughs> I think the 1920s is the, the time to do season one for that, but I'm not holding my breath for that. Uh, nor does it have anything to do with my anti-smoking career. That book is simply a candid biography of my family. I wanted to get to know my dad. He was married four times. He funded two Democratic presidents, Harry Truman, who got us through World War II, and then uh, Roosevelt, who got us through the Depression before that. And, you know, my mom was an actress under contract in Warner Brothers and shared her with rubies and emeralds. Uh, there I am in 1903. No, on the right, <laughs> 1948, makes me 67, and there, they called me Sad Sack, and I wonder where my dad was. Where's my dad? How many of you grew up without your dad living in the house with you? Wow, okay, so some of you share this. I don't know how you feel about it, and I want you to get in touch with your feelings. At least I said that when I speak at high schools. Because that's what's empowering. And I didn't, I was sad. Fire Department of New York, brand new Cadillac, and my mother's duplex in New York City, right across the street from Auntie Maine. And my father loved airplanes. He uh, sent one of his big Delta jets, he was the biggest stockholder in Delta at that time, and to, meet, to get me to meet him for the first time. Because at nine, I wrote him a letter and it said, Dear Dad, I want to meet you. Where are you? And he was traveling, going from place to place. And everywhere he went, he left a forwarding address. And my little letter got into his hands. He was in the South Pacific with his third wife. And when he opened it, he said, I have a son. I said, Dear Dad, I want to meet you. Where are you? Love me, your son. Patrick, over here. <laughs> and he sent for me. Now I'm all excited. My mother brought me up to believe he was like God. And he never, she never said a bad word about him. I knew he broke her heart. But she never said a bad thing. And when the big day came, and they showed me into the room where he was, I found him there lying down on his back. He was dying for him to see him. And there's R.J. Reynolds Jr. And I said to him, Dad, what's wrong? He looked up and he said, I have asthma, son turned out to be emphysema. And there he is with his respiratory therapist. 
In those days, the oxygen bottles were huge. And it turned out to be emphysema, and he died when I was 15. So my father's death had a great deal of, to do with my turning my back on my family heritage and walking away. And I vowed that as I got older, and when later I vowed later that I would do everything in my power to stop young people from smoking and to do everything I could to get in the way of big tobacco. Now, I have a few things to cover. So there's a little about the Reynolds family and why I started doing what I did. I realized I had a great platform when I spoke in Congress in 1986 for the first time. I was covered by the news media pretty widely and, oh my gosh, <laughs> it was, I didn't expect that kind of news coverage. But I realized I had a platform and as I was besieged with requests to speak and to uh, be a media draw at press conferences to promote uh, this or that issue, like a partial smoking ban in the 80s, uh, which was considered so controversial. Some people just didn't want to change. They wanted things the way they always were. And I got more and more involved. And the more I learned about big tobacco and the way they operate from some of my colleagues in the health community, the more committed I became. And I, I founded the website tobaccofree.org. And I'll keep doing this work the rest of my life. Now, let's talk about the cost of tobacco in the US. 170 billion bucks a year, 6 billion uh, health costs from secondhand smoke. Imagine that. Cost of tobacco, again, 956 per house dollar per household burden, and a big productivity loss, and nearly $20 a pack in uh, the cost, medical cost uh, uh, and productivity loss caused by smoking. Internationally, we have 100 million people dying from smoking in the 20th century. We've got 6 million annually today because that when big tobacco saw the handwriting on the wall that tobacco was going to decline in, in the States, they began aggressively marketing in Europe and in the third world, especially where there were poor, uneducated people who didn't know the dangers of smoking the way you and I do. Wow, American products are cool. And the big tobacco took total advantage and began. And in the 60s, there was a 73% increase until I think it ended in 1973 in smoking around the world. And if present trends continue, there will be 1 billion people who die from uh, smoking in this century. Let's talk about smoking trends overall. We've seen a big peak. Let's take a look here. Right around 1953, around there, uh, you see that smoking peaked at around, uh, almost, I think it was around 53% of the population. And it's gone down. It's gone down by more than half in the last 50 years since the Virgin, Surgeon General's first report on smoking in 1964. What were the causes of the big drop in smoking? See there, there, there it goes. So from the peak, it says there 1965, we've gone down to, uh, I knew I was close, uh, to about 17.8, I think it's a little less now, of the US population. What do we have to thank for this big drop in smoking? Well, let me tell you, and I'll be t discussing four points I can get through them all. Our wins came from, first, increasing prevalence of smoking bans, second, higher tobacco taxes, third, state spending on prevention and cessation programs, and fourth, increased uh, regulation uh, of the marketing and advertising of tobacco. So those are the things that we owe these big, let's talk about smoking bans. Began in 1986 with the Surgeon General's first report on secondhand smoke. It causes lung cancer and heart disease, he said. And it's, it, there was an overwhelming body of scientific and medical evidence proving that secondhand smoke caused these diseases. But the tobacco industry began certainly casting doubt on that and said, oh, secondhand smoke is not that harmful. It's never really been proven. 
It began with the cities, municipalities, city governments, city councils around the country began passing, making no smoking areas in restaurants in their city. City governments, in my book, are the most honest. They are the least influenced by lobbyists and legislators, the least corrupt. City governments gave us our first smoking bans, and I'm seeing a big grin in the front row. You know, you've been around the block. And later, we saw states passing statewide smoking bans, and it grew, and it gathered momentum. And today, hardly anybody disputes the science that man smoke causes disease. So I think that um, I'm not here today to talk about the science, but the policy change is quite interesting. Second in smoke, third leading cause of preventable death. World Health Organization said it's killing 600,000 people a year. Hello. And according to the EPA, there's no safe level of secondhand smoke. Uh, the Institute of Medicine said us, gave us, produced a study that said that heart attacks declined, declined by 6 to 47 percent uh, in communities that banned smoking. And sometimes there was a significant drop in smoking caused illness within six months of the smoking ban going into effect. Stunning, stunning stuff. And the Institute of Medicine is a very prestigious group. Today, we have about 65% of the US population covered by comprehensive smoking bans. You have uh, 30 states that have banned smoking statewide, and another 20 states to go. That's where we are now. Internationally, countries have banned smoking nationwide, and that is actually very, very cool. I'm thrilled to point out Italy, Ireland among the first. Who knew? And there is the real Marlboro country. So it's just really an idea whose time has come. Let's talk about tobacco taxes. We've seen huge increases in state and federal tobacco taxes, and these are wonderful, and I'll tell you why. And notice how the greater the smoking rate, the purple line, the lower the t price of cigarettes. And as the price of cigarettes goes up due to tobacco company price hikes and tobacco taxes, you see that there's a direct correlation between the price of tobacco and the cigarette tax and cost of tobacco. Ladies and gentlemen, it means that when you raise the price of tobacco, less children are going to start smoking. And it means that smokers have a very strong financial incentive to quit. And take a look here at the benefits. Oh, put it this way. For eight years, we tried to pass a tobacco tax. And we couldn't get it done. And then in 2009, Congress passed the tobacco tax, raising the federal tax 69 cents a pack. There was an immediate 11% drop in teen smoking. Incredible. And tobacco sales fell 11% after a year. And almost 2 million kids will not become smokers. Tobacco taxes are a win. It's a total win. Look at all those smoking deaths avoided. Huge. Long-term health care savings, 40, almost $44 billion. But before I go on to that, I just want to point out that uh, some taxes are good taxes. Yeah, taxes drag down the economy. It's, nobody likes taxes. But tobacco taxes, ladies and gentlemen, are wonderful. And the state of Georgia's tax, I'm sorry to report to you tonight, is 38 cents a pack, or 37 cents a pack, rather. And it's the 49th or 48th lowest in the entire nation. If you average all the states around Georgia, the tobacco producing states, the average state tax is 48 cents a pack. So it's a disgrace that Georgia has such a low tobacco tax. And 
how many children's lives could be saved? I'm here tonight to tell you that nine out of every 10 smokers gets addicted before reaching the age of 19. Some states are raising the purchase age to 21. California just did it. Hawaii has done it. And I'm sorry to say, I think Georgia's probably a very long way from doing that. But it's something that needs to be done. There's a big movement to raise the tobacco purchase age to 21. Because if we can keep kids off tobacco or make it a lot harder for them to get, we will obviously start winning uh, by keeping them off the addiction. After 21, almost nobody starts smoking. One smoker in 10 starts after 19. So there's a big case to be made for tobacco taxes. Let's look at the third big factor, state spending on tobacco prevention and cessation. And we've seen a big drop in high school smoking. And today it's down to, I think, around 11%. Some states that are spending more on tobacco prevention, like Georgia, uh, these, have much higher rates of youth smoking. So I think in Georgia it's around 11%, but Florida has a rate of 75 to 8%. And they have been spending $70 million a year on tobacco prevention programs. And they have a, certainly got a higher tobacco tax than Georgia. So we've got a million eight being spent here on tobacco prevention. It's practically nothing. The CDC says, well, spend 106 million, please, if you want to be effective. And meanwhile, the state of Georgia is taking in $351 million a year in tobacco taxes and revenues from the lawsuit settlement payments. It is a disgrace. $350 million, and they can't even spend more than a million eight of that to prevent their kids from starting to smoke, and they won't raise the tobacco tax. I mean, it just makes me angry. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I invite you to open your heart. Feel my anger. Get in touch with your anger. Some of you will be speakers, by the way. And if you could reach the heart of the audience by showing your emotions and how you feel, you will be heard. If I stood up here and said, Georgia has a very low tobacco tax and it's a very bad thing, you've got to sleep. Feel my passion. Okay? All right. So the average state tax is a buck sixty, ladies and gentlemen, and it's just sad, sad moment in my talk to deliver you the news about what a disgraceful record the legislators in the Capitol have with regard to tobacco taxes. The report card is uh, almost as dismal. The smoking law is pretty average here. And you get Fs in all the other three areas, tobacco prevention, cessation, and tax. But if all, cut all states cut smoking to the rate of Florida has, 7.5 to 8%, 7 million kids alive today in the US would it's not become smokers. And you'd have 2.3 million kids who would uh, not die prematurely because they didn't smoke. And it would save $122 billion nationally on health care costs if we can cut youth smoking down to 75 to 8%. So it is a bleak picture. Uh, only one state, North Dakota, is now funding its prevention program at CDC recommended levels. And, all, and four other states are barely even making half of what the CDC is recommending. And all the others are spending well below or nothing. Because when the tobacco settlement was reached, with the lawyers suing Big Tobacco on behalf of Medicare, uh, to recover all the costs of Medicare and Medicaid, $246 billion settlement over 25 years, the lawyers for Big Tobacco said, wait a minute, we don't want any of that money to be dedicated to tobacco prevention. It all has to go into the general fund, and our side agreed to it, sadly. So when legislators see money available, uh, tobacco prevention programs are sometimes the very first ones to be cut. So let's take a look at a TV spot. This is the kind of thing we're not seeing in Georgia because of the lack of funding for this. I know what you've done. And I know what you're doing. 
You sell a product that contains addictive chemicals. So your customers stand little or no chance of ever being able to stop using it. Slowly, over time, it kills one third of them. To replace those dead customers, you try to market your product to kids as young as 13. The fact is, you get 89% of the new business from teens. I've seen the proof. It's in your own words, by your own letterhead. Stat the top secret. You screwed up when you tried to have the documents. And now they're on the web. They're on the web. I lost my grandfather. My grandmother was manipulated by your lies for years. My grandfather died because of your product. Was the money you made worth it? You got hits. Selling product kills over 1,200 people a day. Every day. So while you're rotting around in a comfortable house, watching this message, look into my eye. I know what you did, and I know what you're doing. That's why I got involved. And I won't stop until everyone else knows what you're doing, too. That's what we're not seeing in Georgia. Now, the Obama administration, under the Affordable Care Act, did mount uh, the tips from former smokers. And they spent $40, $50 million on it. I think it was renewed for a while. Don't know if it's still on. But the point is, it, it shouldn't come from the federal. It should come from the legislators in the Capitol. Now, what's stopping our progress? One gets the tobacco industry. They have spent a fortune on lobbying. Uh, one points all this money, millions going into lobbying Congress. 16.6 uh, .6 million in 2010. Oops, let's go back. And 75 million spent on an advertising campaign to meet to defeat a ballot measure. They're spending, they've already spent $37 million on it to stop a tobacco tax in California. They'll probably spend $70 million by the time they're done on that. So they're putting a ton of money into lobbying legislators and into advertising to defeat very important ballot measures. Campaign finance reform has got to go. Looks like I'm advertising, marketing kids, women, and... That is just outrageous. How much time do I have? Hmm? Ten? Okay. Thank you. I'll take all the time I can get. Yes. OK. That is outrageous. How did that come to be? Well, I stand up on the stage at high schools, and I like to tell them. And I say, why is it legal? The first thing our founding fathers decided to change is the first, and the First Amendment provided for Thank you. Freedom of speech means I can stand up on the stage and I can say the sky is purple and the clouds are green. I can't yell fire in here because somebody get hurt. But there's an old law in the books that gives corporations the same rights to, you know, as civil liberties as people. Corporations are still legally people. When Mitt Romney said corporations are people, he meant it. And we need to repeal that law because I say to you tonight that a $9 billion a year advertising and marketing campaign is a very different kind of speech than the sky is purple and the clouds are green. Our Constitution was meant to protect individuals and people, not cor giant corporations with multi-billion dollar ad campaigns. That's how that came to be. Rappers, DJs on the cover of a special edition, package of cool. And this whole thing. These are, all these ads are gone, happily, because <laughs> I thought you would relate well to that and that. Joe Chemo, we call him. And his friends, they finally showed up for his funeral. All right, so on advertising, they're spending $10 billion. It's 26 million a day. I'm going to fly through these because I need to get to my end. Tobacco spends on advertising annually, 9.6 billion. And it's not much being spent on tobacco prevention. They're outspending us by 20 to 1 advertising dollars versus health community prevention and cessation dollars. 20 to 1. And there you've got 25 billion in tobacco revenue coming in. 3.3 billion is what the state should spend, according to the CDC, but they're only spending 468 million. 
So about quitting smoking. One point I really want to make with you tonight is if a patient uh, smokes, let them know, please, you intervening makes all the difference. The studies show that when medical staff intervene with smoking patients, I may not want to bother, I'm just bored, I just want to intervene. Let them know first that if you've tried to quit smoking before and failed, take comfort in the fact that most smokers do fail several times before they finally stop successfully. Don't get a message, you can't quit. View this as part of the normal journey toward becoming a non-smoker. Get in a program. People who succeed in life get help. It's a recurring theme in my high school talk. People who succeed get help. Real men ask directions. So tell them to get in a program. And tell them you can do it. OK, so we're going to move through that. Counseling, I'm not going to get into this. The nicotine the therapies. 95% of people who quit without a program uh, fail after within one year. 85% of people who use the best therapies we have still go back to smoking within one year. So your, but your chances triple by being in a program. Don't promise them a magic pill. It's not going to help. It's going to be painful. Be a big boy. It's part of being an adult. We face pain when pe parents die or whatever. Grow up and face your pain. Don't have to be that harsh with patients, but let them know there's no magic pill. It's going to hurt. And breathe. And if I had time, I'd have you all stand up and <sighs> But I'll <clears throat> release you from that. But that's the big way to quit. And John Bradshaw says we're a nation of addicts. We're not just addicted to one thing. It's drugs and you know, cigarettes and so many people, uh, <laughs> some dating. Uh, you know, and it's because people don't want to feel their pain. Awe. E-cigarettes, we've covered that. My colleague covered that pretty effectively, I thought. It tripled in a year, though, from 2013 to 2014, and it now exceeds the regular use of cigarettes. And an astonishing, and it contains all these horrible chemicals, an astonishing 24% of teens now report using e-cigarettes within the last 30 days. It has gone up in, by 2015 to one quarter of our teens, where smoking is down to 11% among our kids. Starter kits, yada yada, big problems, no regulation. Vapor has all these carcinogens, like lead. And I like to say, if I do a spot on cable news, it's like jumping out of the fifth story. Maybe it's like jumping out of the fifth story instead of the tenth story. Because we don't know how dangerous they are. It takes 30 years to get the disease smoking causes. They're using all the same playbook for their advertising campaigns as uh, they did with the tobacco brands. And they're heavily advertising, and that one got pulled off the market. Thank you very much. Chewing tobacco, I don't think we need to do too much there, but 14% of our boys, youth, teens, have been using tobacco, you know, chewing tobacco. And this is the reality that they need to see. These are speakers who speak at high schools who are quite good. And I love to sit and tell the story. It's a five-minute segment of my talk. But you can see it on my video online at my site. And this boy died at 19 from cancer of the jaw. And they just go, really? And this gets them to stop. If any of you see a patient who is under the age of 25, send them to me. And I will get them to the right person. I'll find a state ad agency where they're still spending money on making ads. And we will get a video crew down there. And we will make one of the most powerful TV spots you've ever seen if we can ever find another boy who looks like that due to tobacco. I want to close tonight with my thoughts about, and I hope some of you will research this and consider doing this as a, a research piece. I believe that children today 
and not, I believe, I know that kids today are worried about the future. The Yankelovich Partner Study in the early 1990s said that kids today are, have a keen sense of diminished expectations. They don't think there'll be as much there for them as there was for their parents. So we need to do something about that. I, when I speak to them, I say, catch my faith. It's in my video, at the end of the video that we market to high schools and middle schools, my talk for youth, the truth about tobacco. It's on Amazon. And I close that with, catch my faith. But no matter what happens, yes, we have new diseases like Zika virus and AIDS and swine flu and bird flu, and it's a scary time. Yes, we have terrorist attacks. We had 911. Yes, we have uh, the threat of a collapse of the economy. I hear Deutsche Bank is not doing so well today. But we will get through those problems together. And on the other side of those things, there, is wondrous, there are wondrous things coming. So catch my, call me crazy, but catch my faith that there are amazing times and things coming ahead in this world. And you will need your health, every precious bit of it, in the incredible years ahead of us all. I close tonight with a promise. I have a vision and share my vision that we will have a tobacco-free society. It's coming one day. One day there'll be a society free where parents are there longer for their kids and, and smoking will be no more. That day is coming. And I look forward to it. Thank you. A lot of state municipalities and legislatures around the country are starting to put addendums on their smoking law, which requires that e-cigarettes be treated the same way as tobacco. Uh, the taxes and the, the bans in public. So we're seeing that start to rise. And I you know, would advocate that they treat e-cigarettes the same as tobacco, the same tax, the same, uh, you know, don't do it in public, and let's have education out there because one study, 24%, uh, excuse me, it was more like a third of the teens that were surveyed filling out multiple choice, what's in e-cigarettes? And the choices were uh, just flavoring, uh, don't know other, or nicotine, and one third of them got nicotine, but two thirds of them didn't know they had nicotine. They had no idea how addictive they were, so education campaigns were important.